but it's so good to see you guys that you made it out today. So good to have all of you watching by the internet. Also, so glad you guys are well. We have so many people with the flu that are, uh, somebody said that the flu shot did not work this year. So I'm just glad you guys are feeling good. Hey, I'm excited about today because next week we start a brand new series called Bold. But before we go into a brand new series next week, I just kind of want to share my heart with you today in a message that I titled 51 and Counting. Now, I've been uh, all week long trying to get that number in my head, 51, because for Cultivate Church, we are week number 51. We launched here January 8th of this year, and it's really hard to believe that a year has already come and nearly gone. And on January 13th of 2013, it's going to be our one-year anniversary celebration. And it's just hard to believe. Pastor Brandon Dawson and I were just talking about it this morning, how, you know, you think about something, you dream about something, and you spend all this time in preparation, and then before you know it, you turn around, and a year is gone. It's already come, and it's passed so quick. And this morning, I believe it's important for all of us to think about that 51 and counting. Because inside that 51, it really uh, represents a whole lot of stuff that's happened this year in just 51 weeks of being at Cultivate Church. And one of the things that sta uh, stands out to me that I celebrate over every day, and we talk about it every week, is just this year at Cultivate, in 51 weeks, we've seen 92 people give their heart to Jesus this year. And I just think that's absolutely incredible, that this year, 92 people who did not have a relationship with Jesus walked in this building and heard heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and said yes. And out of the baptisms and stuff we've had this year, we've heard people that uh, have been atheists their whole lives, people that were hurt, mad at God, people who had never thought they would have a relationship with God or let alone sit in a church building. And they've said yes to Jesus and it's totally changed their life all the way around. And in 51 weeks, we've personally, out of our church, been able to send two people out to do world missions. Matthew Vaughn, uh, many of you know Matthew running around here does all kind of different stuff. If you're part of our church, but he's actually in uh, children's ministry today doing uh, kids' church. But we were actually able to send uh, help him go to Bolivia for three months where he ministered to kids and uh, he plucked chickens and killed chickens and, you know, you know, the whole deal with a chicken. That's what he did every single day. He sent an email one day, said, I'm so tired of chickens. I hope I never see a chicken again. And, uh, you know, not only was he doing all different kinds of ministry, but Matthew Vaughn actually uh, was in a, a little town. And in the area where he was, a man died right there in the street. And he said that this man's body laid in the street for three days. And people just stepped over him. They walked past him going into a children's center. And Matthew Vaughn said, this is the craziest thing I have ever seen. And he himself dug a... Uh, a grave for this man that he did not know on his own and buried this man and had a funeral for this guy right there in the street. And I thought, if that's not ministry, I don't know what is. But cultivate of all the things that we got to take part in, we were a part of Matthew Vaughn burying a man in the street in Bolivia. Uh, not only Matthew Vaughn, but Ali Kendrick, who is still out of the country doing uh, missions work in 11 countries in 11 months. She's at her six-month mark. She just left Africa. Africa, where they've been doing hut-to-hut uh, -hut ministry. You ever heard of door-to-door -door ministry in America? They were hut-to-hut -hut where there were no electricity, where there were no restrooms, there were no running water. And she signed up for this on purpose. I said, Allie, you know, what are you thinking? But she signed up to do this with her life. That in 11 months, she's going to be in a different country with different people that she don't even know how to connect with. Before she left, she said, I just hope we don't have to go door-to-door. -door. And not only did she go door-to-door, -door, but it was hut-to-hut. -hut. And I don't know about you, but I celebrate the fact that we got to be a part of that this year. Another thing that really blows my mind about the 51 church, and I'm just saying this because this is us together, that you got to take part in this, is that we were able to give away over $10,000 this year to world, local, and national missions work, church planning. We were able to serve our city and the world over $10,000 that a brand new church right here in town was able to put together and make happen. I don't know about you, but but to me, that is exciting. It is something that we can get excited about. There's been so much that has taken place in 51 weeks. 
Now, if you think about your life in this year and what God's done in you, many of you have got great stories of celebration this year in 51 weeks, and then there are some of you that have a lot in the past 51 weeks that brings back a lot of hurt, brings back a lot of pain, some of that that you want to get rid of, that you want to leave these 51 weeks behind you. And that's when we get into the part where we say 51 and counting, because how many of you know that it's not over yet? I believe truly that this next year, God's best is yet to come for Cultivate Church. And when I say cultivate church, I don't mean this building. I don't mean this Sunday morning. I mean for your life. I mean for your family because it is the people. It is you. It is me. All of us together who make up cultivate church. And I honestly believe that God is preparing for all of us something great for 2013. Now, as you come in here, you may expect this sort of talk on a Sunday morning, this, you know, brand new year and to get fired up and you think, well, we do this every year. But I honestly believe that God is really preparing the best to come. I believe that this year has been a foundation. How many of you know you can't build anything great until you have a solid foundation? And God has really helped us this year with a great and solid foundation. Now, I didn't put any uh, notes in your worship guide today because I just want you to be able to just take notes at your leisure. We do mostly series here at Cultivate, but I did put a blank sheet in there, so if you want to take some notes that you may want to write those down. But I want to give you a verse of Scripture that is absolutely one of my favorite verses of Scripture of all time. And it comes out of Isaiah chapter 43, and it's verses 18 and 19. And listen what it says. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Now I mentioned in that 51, there are some of us in this room that are celebrating 51 weeks of our life so far this year. And then there are some of you that are saying, I cannot wait until we get to go to the and counting part, that we leave all this behind. And what I love about this verse of Scripture is I believe that it speaks to everybody. Because it says, forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. Now if you just back up, just a couple of verses right before uh, chapter, in this chapter, right before verse 18 and 19, it's recounting one of the great miracles of God. It says, I am the same God who parted the seas that you were able to walk through on dry land. And then the very next sentence says, forget about that. That's yesterday. That's behind you. That was, that was then and this is now. And for us, as we recount all the great things that God's done, for some of us that say, man, this has been the best year I could have ever hoped for, what God is saying for us in this moment is you've got to forget those things and you've got to get ready to embrace the now and the things that God is about to do. I believe that 92 people is just a scratch of the surface of what God is going to bring the, the people that are going to find life here at Cultivate Church. I believe that $10,000 is a drop in the bucket of the generosity as a church that we're going to be able to have. We told you, some of you that's been with us through the journey of Cultivate, that we didn't come here to get and to gain, that we came here to be a generous church and to love our city, to love our county, and to make a difference in the world. And already we've been able to set the foundation for that. Forget those miracles. They're great and God is blessed, but we need to be able to embrace what God is about to do. And then for the rest of it, it's saying, I cannot wait for this year to pass, to be gone, for it to be behind me that this has been a tough year. There's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain that I'm still struggling with this year. Jesus says, the Bible, setting this up, what he will do for us is this. He will make a way in the wasteland. He will make streams in the desert. Meaning that everything that is dead, that is lifeless, that is seemingly like there is no hope for you in your life, he says, I'm going to bring something brand new. I'm going to speak to what is dead. I'm going to bring a harvest to those areas in your life. And this morning, that's what I hope to do. I just hope to encourage us this morning and help us wrap it in our mind, grab it and put it in our heart that this year, that this is the time, this is the season, this is the moment. If you choose to embrace the things that God has for your life, that I truly believe that God's going to do something great for us. Something that you would have never been able to think. The Bible actually says, even more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine, is what God wants to do through you and in you, through me, in me, in the life of our church, in the life of your family members, your friends, the people that maybe you thought, there is no hope. There's nothing that can be done. But God's saying, forget yesterday. Forget what you know and get ready for the brand new thing. So here's what I want to do. I just want us to pray. Father, I love you so much. And I thank you for every person that is in this room today, God. God, I just thank you that there is hope, that there's possibility. God, that you're going to do something brand new inside of each and every one of us. And Father, I just pray that this morning that we don't just walk in here as another Sunday. God, that we don't just leave the same way we came. But Father, truly, God, you would speak to us. So right now, God, I just pray that you open our ears, that we hear you speak to us. 
God, don't let it be anything that I say, no preconceived ideas. God, just let us hear you clearly. And God, open our minds so that we understand what it is that you're speaking to us. God, that your word becomes alive to us. And Father, open our hearts so that we retain it. God, not just hearers of your word, but doers. So that when we walk out of this place, our life is changed. And God, not only our life, but the lives of others around us, God, that we can make an impact to all the people. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to bring you to a familiar story that's familiar to me, and maybe, uh, maybe you've heard it, maybe you've never heard it. But there's a story that goes back in the Scripture, back in Exodus chapter 4, and it's about a man named Moses. And I don't know if you know who Moses is, but Moses is um, really, he's credited for a lot of the miracles that we see early on, that God shows up and does a lot of these great things. Just in Isaiah, we were reading about God parting the sea. Moses was a part of that great miracle. But Moses was not unlike any of us, like you or like me, just everyday, ordinary, average people. He was a shepherd, and that was what he did for a living. That's what he did uh, for 40 years of his life. He watched sheep. He, he took care of the flocks and made sure that they were taken care of and nothing got them. It was his business. It was his livelihood. And Moses one day, you may have heard the story or watched the movie, that a burning bush showed up, and he walks over to check out what's going on with that burning bush. How does a bush catch on fire but yet not burn up? And when he approaches this bush to take a look at it, God begins to speak to him and says, Moses, I want to do something great in your life. I want to use you to do some great things. And not unlike you or me, uh, Moses first says, well, God, I, you know, I can't be used by you. He begins to give all these different excuses. But it begins a process in his life. To where God says, I know where you are right now, and I know what you've been. I know what your yesterday was. But at this encounter, at this moment, at this intersection in your life, I'm calling you to something greater. That I've designed you and I've purposed you for greatness. Not just the everyday, average, mundane, but I want to take you from where you are, and I want to begin to live out your purpose. We say at Cultivate Church to discover what it means to live life on purpose. And see, Moses had been living life to that, that point. He was very content with his life. He was very happy. He had a great business. He was doing everything he knew to do. But God showed up and said, I want to help you live out your purpose, your destiny. And just like Moses, each and every one of us has that moment with God where we feel like God shows up, wakes us up, and says, I've got a great purpose for you. Not just about your yesterday, but about your today, about your tomorrow, about the days that are going to be counted to come. So I want to take you to uh, Exodus chapter 4, and I put the verses on the screen, and this is what it says. The Lord said to him, this is after the burning bush experience, he says, what is that in your hand? And he replies, a staff. The Lord says, well, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out his hand, took a hold of the snake, and it turned back into the staff in his hand. Now this morning, they're going to bring me, I brought the closest thing that I could actually find of what would actually be what Moses may have carried, a staff. Now, some of the staffs that, you know, you see them carry, some of them have a, a hook on the end. Uh, I don't know how tall Moses was. He may not have been quite as tall as I am, so it may not have been, it might have been a little bigger to him. But this is what he carried. Every day that he got up, this, this revolved around his life. This represented several different things about his life. See, when God showed up and began to speak to him about this very thing, see, to us it sounds so simple in the context of the scripture. When we read it like a storybook, we think, well, take it, throw it down, now pick it up, and then God's doing all these crazy things with Moses. But you've got to remember that it's in the middle of a very important segment in his life. It's where God is pulling him out from what's comfortable. It's where God is beginning to pull Moses from everything that he has ever known. See, in the scripture, when God begins to speak with him about this, really there are three things that God begins to speak with Moses about. You maybe you want to write these down. Number one, in thinking about this, this, this whole situation where God is speaking to him, when he says, throw this down, he's talking about Moses' identity. The first thing that he's talking about is who Moses is. This right here represents his life. He had been a shepherd for 40 years. When people knew him, they knew that he was a shepherd. They knew what he did. They knew that he, uh, every day that he got up, that he took care of the flocks, that he ran this business, that he was identified as, as a shepherd. It's who he was. And now, after 40 years of this work, God is showing up and saying, lay down your identity. Put it down. Take what you have and lay it on the ground. 
The second thing that I thought is interesting about this, that I kind of thought about what God was saying, was number two was lay down your security. This is, this is his income and his security. This is his business. If he throws this down, if he lays before God what he's been doing for his whole life, what God is saying is, well, you've got to start relying on yourself. Because this is his income. This is what pays the bills. This is what brings home the bacon, if you would say that. It's like God showing up and saying, here's what you do, now I want you to stop. Well, I'm about to take you another whole direction. Forty years of building a business. Now, back in the day, if you owned lots of flocks, that was like owning lots of Lamborghinis and Ferraris in your house. You know what I mean? It's like if you pull up, you know, cribs. If you take cribs back in the day, you got lots of sheep. You know, that's like, raise the barn. Let me show you all my sheep. You know, that's how it worked back in the day. So if Moses, 40 years, I imagine he was probably doing pretty well for himself. Those, you know, those sandals he had on, that dress he was wearing, it was the top of the line. It was the best of the best, Okay, 40 years, I imagine this guy's doing pretty good. And then one day, God shows up and says, lay it down. Put this down. Moses, what is in your hand? What is it that you're holding on to? The third thing that I thought about this was, it was Moses' influence. This is what Moses used to influence. If you're a good businessman in the community for 40 years, how many of you know he's probably connected in the community? That probably when people walk in the room, they go, oh, there's Moses. Let's find out what Moses has to say about this situation. Moses has been a part of our community. Moses has been around. He knows who we are. He knows the system. Let's talk with him. It was his influence. It's everything in his life that mattered. It was everything that he had lived for. Everything that he had set out for his life to be. And he was okay with it. He was completely happy. But it's in those moments sometimes in our life when we get completely happy that out of the blue, God shows up and says, hey, what are you holding on to? What's in your hand? What's comfortable to you? What do you know really, really well? What is it that you don't want to give up for me? What is it about 51 that's been really good? And what is it about the end counting that scares you? So here's what I want to ask you this morning is what is in your hand this year? Right now as you sit in this room, what are you holding on to? What is in your life? The greater purpose, the greater destiny, the greater plan that God has gifted to you. What are the gifts, the talents, the abilities that God has put inside of you that you're still holding on to? I tell people this all the time that can sing or people that can play instruments. I say, you know what? If you don't start using that, I'm going to start praying against you. If you don't start singing or playing, I'm going to pray that God takes it away from you and that he gives it to me. Because you know what? If God will grant that prayer for me, I'm going to use your gift. I will make it happen. I will do something with it. I won't just sit on it or make it, you know, obsolete. I will make it happen. God has gifted you with something. Some of you have the greatest personalities in the world. You can just speak to somebody and they just just that suddenly their day is totally different. Some of you are just able to sit at a computer and do all kind of crazy stuff. You're gifted that way. You've got gifts. God has wired you with something great. And maybe we've been holding on to the things that seem so insignificant. Maybe we think they're not a big deal, but it's what God's gifted you with. It's what God's purposed you with and for. And there's a greater purpose. There's a greater desire for God to do something with your life. So you ask the question, well, God, if you've done that, then what is it for? How do I use it? What do you want me to do with it? And I thought three things that I want to give you that I think are worth writing down this morning. Kind of a process that I want to give you. That I would say that here's how you do it. The first thing is I would say that you need to choose to give your life away. That if you choose to give your life away, then everything about your life will change. Now here's what that means. That sounds like church talk, but let me break it down for just, just every day. Your life is not your own. You matter for more than yourself. Christmas Give me, here's what I want. The first thing we do about Christmas is we ask people, you know, what do you want? What is it about you? What is it about you? What is your list? What have you written down? What have you been shopping for? It seems to become centered on us. When we find out that somebody else in the office got a raise and we want to know, well, what happened to my raise? I've been working harder than you. I work longer hours than you. What about me? What about mine? And we just become a society where everything is about us. But what Jesus said is he came to serve and not to be served. He came to give his life away. And every one of us, God would want for us to give our life away. What Moses was holding in his hand was his life. And God shows up and says, Moses, throw it down. So verse 3, it says, Moses took it and he threw it on the ground. 
He took what represented his life and he laid it down on the ground before God. He surrendered it. At that moment, he gave it away. And as I thought about that thought and I think about our church, guys, I was able just to count. I was so amazed at the people in our church that have given their life away this year so that 92 people could give their heart to Jesus this year. We've got people who are working in children's ministry, who are holding babies, who are teaching uh, kids from uh, all up to age 12 years old about Jesus Christ, who are ministering the gospel in a way that they can understand in an environment that a kid wants to be in and can learn in. We have people back there who, uh, who sometimes never even get to attend a Sunday morning. We have people who serve in our children's ministry who have never to this day sat in this room and experienced Cultivate Worship and been a part of our Sunday morning experience in here. Why? Because they chose to give their life away. Because God had gifted them. God had called something and placed it on their heart so that ministered uh, to families so their kids can be touched, so that families can be touched. Can I tell you this? I've been a part of churches before where you had like kids running up and down the aisle. You had kids coming over and, you know, running down and slapping other kids on the neck. And kids like, you ever sat in church and had a kid turn around and stare at you while you are in church? It's so uncomfortable. It's so awkward. Because you know you're not supposed to look and you can't say anything, but you want to say, turn around, you know, and you want to get the parents and you want to shake them and tell them, set their kid down. I've been there, but if you notice at Cultivate Church, we just don't do that. We, we value kids so that they can be in an environment where they can learn, and we value people who walk in this building who don't have a relationship with Jesus, and they need to hear the word, and not a kid staring at them in the face, you know. That's the goal. That's the reason that we do what we do, and that's the reason that it matters so much, because if there's a family that's in your life or it's in my life. And we've been begging, we've been asking for them to come and hear the gospel. And that Sunday, they finally say yes, and they walk in this room. There are no distractions. It is nothing but them and the presence of God to do that. And there's no other way that could happen without people who give their life away so that lives and children can be touched. It's absolutely amazing to me. I started counting up this week, and I counted over 20 people who drive an hour to be here at Cultivate Church every week. Now, is that not crazy? I don't want to drive an hour for anywhere, especially not to get up early. We have people who are on our dream team who are here early in the morning. I live 10 minutes away, and I complain that I got to get here early in the morning. It's cold. I want to stay in the bed. But these people drive over an hour to show up, to serve, to be a part. And then people who drive an hour just to attend. I told a guy a couple of weeks ago, I said, man, you're driving too far. I said, there are great churches between your house and here. Let us help you find one. And he said, I got to be honest with you. He said, if it was farther than an hour, I would drive it. He said, it's worth it every single week that I make it happen. And I looked at him and said, let's find you somewhere else to go. But he said, oh no, it's worth it to be here because this is where God is speaking to me. It amazes me that these people give their life away. And I thought about some other people, a part of our team, and one that just sticks out to me is, is, is Pastor Derek. And uh, many of you know, you know Pastor Derek. He's always got something good to say. He's always going to laugh about everything. On Even if it's not funny, he's going to laugh at it. You know, Sometimes you don't know if he's just making you feel good or if he's sincere. It's kind of uncomfortable at times. But you, know, he just, you, you just love him. You meet him one time, you fall in love with him. And if you don't know him, you may walk away and go, man, that guy's yeah, he's a little over the top. But, but at least he was nice to me. You know what I mean? But we love Derek. And, you know, many of you don't know Derek's full story. Uh, Pastor Derek, his, his dream was to be on uh, staff at a church from a teenager. And he started out in a church that really wasn't, um, you know, probably his pick of the litter. You know that old saying? It really wasn't probably his number one pick. But God had placed him in ministry and he was faithful there. And then God finally brought him out of the place he was in and put him in his dream place. God put him in a brand new church plant about two hours from here in his own city who he had a passion for, the place he grew up. This church begins to explode. Derek comes on staff full-time. He's working there. Derek begins uh, student ministry there. Students went from zero to like 150 kids, like overnight. The church is running like over 1,000 people. They got so many people getting saved and getting baptized, they can't even keep up. I mean, God is just doing wonders where he is. And then my phone rings one day, and it's Derek. And he says, um, I got to talk to you. What's going on? He said, well, I feel like God's just been speaking to me. And I feel like I'm supposed to be at Cultivate. And my response is, Derek, are you stupid? You know, what, what are you thinking? What is wrong with you? I heard you pray. I knew what God had laid on your heart. I knew that this was the dream come true. I said, Derek, man, this is everything that you've asked God for. And he said, I know, but I, there's just something inside of me that I feel like I'm supposed to be with you guys. And he said, I just want you to help me pray. 
And I said, all right, Derek, I'll help you pray. And really what I was praying is for God just to give him some common sense. You know, that's what, that's what I was praying for, Derek. And then several weeks goes by, and he calls me, and he says, listen, i got to tell you something. I've made the decision that, um, that we're coming, that we want to be a part, and I'm going to let my pastor know, and uh, we're going to, you know, do whatever he wants me to do, but i just got to share my heart with him. And the, sun, the Friday before Derek was supposed to tell their church on that Sunday, I called him. I said, Derek, I just want you to know, I won't be mad if you back out now. Like, you know, just stay where you are. And if you don't know of us about Cultivate Church, but we're brand new, and, and you know, we're just making it happen, so, you know, we all went, Pastor Brandon and I, at separate churches and loved being where we were. We went from full-time places where we could do what we loved every day to now we do whatever we can do to make money, you know, to make it happen so that we can, yeah, we say support our habit. You know, this is our habit, and we're doing whatever we can to pay for our habit. And not only did we do that, but Pastor Brandon Dawson and I have been dreaming about this for years. We knew God was sending us here years ago. But then you got Derek, who just out of the blue says, God's been tugging at my heart, and I know that I need to be a part. He gave his life away. And this is what he told. He said, I wouldn't care how much I got paid. I wouldn't care how great it was or what it looked like on the outside. But if I'm not doing what God's called me to do, I'm going to be miserable. And he said, I'd rather be happy for free <laughs> than be miserable and get paid. And he said, the Bible says to know to do good and do it not is a sin. And he said, I know what God said to me. And can I tell you, church, we're a lot better church because Pastor Derek has given his life away to be here at Cultivate with us. Pastor Brandon Dawson and Danielle, they were at the beach, for goodness sake. They were on the beach. They lived two minutes from their church. He rode a bicycle to church. <laughs> Got it made. Brand new baby girl. They lived for free. They didn't pay anything for where they lived. In a sweet condo on the golf course with swimming pools and, and everything else. They lived for free. God had blessed them. <laughs> and then they're going to move up here with nothing. For nothing. But can I tell you this? When you give your life away, everything else disappears. Church, don't be afraid. This year, maybe God is just asking you to give your life Away. I know this didn't sound like anything you want to sign up for. But number two, the second thing is how you make it happen. When you think, I can never do that. God, I'm afraid the price is too much. I don't want any part of that. Second thing is you got to give your trust away. You got to give your trust away. When we moved down here uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we left our jobs, we left our paychecks, uh, we left insurance being paid for. I mean, we just, we were blessed. God had really taken care of us. And um, when we moved down here, we had to have somewhere to live. And I know, I think Pastor Brandon shared this with some of you, but when we moved and packed on a Friday afternoon, we had to be out of our house in Trustville, and they were moving up from Gulf Shores. We still had no place to go. We had not found a home yet. The tornado stuff had just taken place. Uh, there were no empty houses. There, there, were, there were nowhere to go, honestly. We had closed our moving truck. They were leaving out the next morning, and, and we had no clue what we were going to do or where we were going to go. And we said, God, if this is you, this is what you want from us, God, you're going to have to help us. And long story short, it was that afternoon we got a phone call. We went and looked at a house, and God had provided for us. That afternoon, God had provided a place for us to go. The only catch was... Um, we only found one house. Uh, we didn't find two. And if you're keeping up with this story, there are two families, one house. <laughs> this doesn't add up. So we said, all right, how are we going to make this work? A part of our prayer moving to this city had been, God, we need a place big enough for whoever moves and can pay for it. God, we need a place where we have enough room to meet on Sunday so that we can build a launch team. Because we moved in July, we were going to launch in January. And it just so happened that one house came available that was big enough for two families to live in. Split level, completely put together. So to freak some of you out, we said, God, we're going to trust you. And the Doss family and the Matthews family all moved down here to Alabaster into one house for an entire year. Now, if I can tell you that God is real and God will take care of you, God will bless you, he proved it to me that last year because two families coexisted in one house, one with a baby, one with just a sweet little dog, and we all made it happen. God took care of us. We gave our trust away when we laid everything down. You notice in the story with Moses, it became a snake. Not figuratively, but literally. It became a snake. God does crazy things in our life sometimes. It became a snake. Moses jumped back. His first reaction was he jumped back. You know why he did that? Because he had common sense. He got away. It was a snake. Are you keeping up? It was a snake. He jumped back. Common sense. When we started moving out here, when it came down to one house, no money, no provision, it looked like, I, God, this ain't what I was thinking about. We're going to jump back just a moment. 
But what we did was say, God, you know what you've called us to do. We know you've spoke to us. So God, we're open. We're willing to do anything. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to lay our trust down. Right now, we're going to lay our trust down. The Bible just says simply that Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. He threw it on the ground. I gave you another verse of Scripture. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith is the confidence that we have in what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And if you want to know how to build that trust, you need to get in God's Word. Trust is built in the Word of God. Do you know there are over 5,000 promises in the Word of God for you to stand on? There are 365 fear knots in the Bible. When you get scared, you quote one every single day to yourself. Trust in Him is built in God's Word. Some of you are afraid about the and counting. 51's been good, but the and counting is scary because you don't know what God's going to ask of you this year. But take what you have, what you're holding on to, what you're so afraid to let go of, and you lay it down and you watch what God does with it. You just watch how God does it. The last thought that I wrote down for myself was that you need to give your obedience away. You need to give your obedience away to God. Some of you in this room, God, you already know God has spoke to you. God's told you stuff. God, is, God has directed you, but it's just hard to obey. It's hard to sacrifice. It's hard to give your life away. It's hard to trust sometimes in the things that God has called us to. But the Bible says Moses reached out and he took a hold of the snake. That's the part where it gets crazy to me. It's a snake. I'm cool with the jumping back. That's a cool trick God did. All right, now I want to say, all right, God, now turn it back. Let's see, turn it back. But before he turned it back, God said, you need to reach down. You need to pick it up. I don't play with snakes. But if God says it, how many of you know I'd rather be in his obedience than in disobedience? So Moses simply just said, God, I don't know what you're doing. Hopefully by the tail, he reached down and he picked it up. The Bible says it turned back into the staff in his hand. See, what is important to understand is it was just a stick. There was nothing really significant about that. But it was just a sign of everything that was a part of Moses' life. And then if you follow Moses throughout the scripture, you see a lot of times, we've already talked about the parting of the sea, what God say to do. He says, Moses, you take that, that staff and you hold it out and you watch the sea part. Moses carried that with him that once just prodded and poked sheep that, that staff that was once just a pole to lean on when he got tired. That staff that was once just an everyday, common, ordinary part of his life suddenly became used for something so different, so miraculous. It became something that changed literally the world and set the course for what God wanted to do in his people. What you hold in your hand, ever so common, ever so ordinary, that seems so insignificant, when God speaks to you and asks you to lay it down, let him do his work with it and then give it back to you. God is saying, I'm going to take what you have, so common, so insignificant, so ordinary, and I'm going to use it for the extraordinary. I'm going to do something so great from the 51 to the counting. This next year as we move forward into your life, I encourage you to prepare yourself to give your life, your trust, and your obedience away to God. Next week, we're going to begin a brand new series called Bold. And I encourage you to be here. Because it's going to take the practical, everyday elements of our life. Just like that staff, practical, everyday. And we're going to learn how to be bold in the everyday, common, ordinary places of our life. And watch God shape us into people who can rattle a city, a county, next year. A place that can be prepared for the hurting, the lost, the lonely the people who have felt like nobody cares, that God's going to use us to prepare us to receive those people to see new life change happen in 2013. We also, in a few weeks at our anniversary day, January 13th, we're going to set off on a 21-day prayer and fasting, which simply means that we're going to deny ourselves and we're going to give all of that attention toward God and begin to prepare our hearts for what God wants to do. So I encourage you in this act of obedience and giving your heart, your life away, that over these next few weeks you begin to pray, you begin to seek God like never before. That you just ask God every day, God, just open me up 
Search my heart. Show me, God, what you have for me, what you want me to do. God, what it is you want out of me in 2013. And I promise you, God wants to do something so great in your life. But this morning, we all understand that it's nothing about this church. It's nothing about us. But it's all about Jesus. And he is the element. He is the life change. He is the moment where everything is different in your life. And I would say this morning that if you're here and you don't have that relationship with him, that that's the very first step you need to do into giving your life away. Is it needs to be connected with Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to do this morning. I just want to ask if everybody, maybe you just bow your head. Just close your eyes where you are. We don't do anything funny or weird. Nobody's going to sneak up on you or drag you out of a seat. We're not going to make you stand up, come to the front. None of that stuff. I just want to have a chance to pray for you. Maybe you're watching by the internet this morning and you just say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And I need to give my life away to him. Maybe today is the day. Maybe you've been here and maybe you've had that relationship. But over time, life just happened. Life comes to all of us. And sometimes it gets the best of us. And maybe today you just like to say, Jesus, I want to give it back to you. And if you're here today and that's you, I just want you to do this for me. I just want you to raise your hand. Just so I know who I'm praying for. Again, we're not going to come get you. We're not going not to do anything. I see your hand. God bless you. But I want to know who I'm agreeing with this morning that God is about to change your life, that you're giving yourself over to him. Come on, anybody else? I can see yours. God bless you. Online, if that's you, just respond where you are. And I'm going to pray for all the hands lifted this morning. Second set of people I want to pray for is maybe you're here and you just said, you know what? I have been holding on to some stuff. I've got gifts, talents, abilities. I feel God tugging at my heart to do something great. But I've been afraid of what it was going to cost me. I've enjoyed the 51. I've enjoyed everything up to this point. It's the end counting that scares me. It's the tomorrow. It's the risk. It's the price that I have to pay. And maybe this morning you just want us to say, remember me in this prayer. Because I know God's got a, and a great blessing in store if I'll only be obedient. If I'll only say yes. If I'll only get past the security and just give my life away. I want to pray for you as well this morning. That God would begin to prepare our lives to be bold this next year. In 2013. Father, I love you. Thank you for every person in this room and every person watching by the internet. God, thank you that you use us. Thank you for 92 people that said yes to Jesus. Thank you for over $10,000 that we've been able to give to bless our city. Thank you for people out of our church that have said, I'll answer the call to give my life away for people across the world. Thank you for people who give their every single week away to minister to kids to greet, to serve, to set up, to tear down so that life change can happen. And it's all because of your son, Jesus. And Jesus is what changes our life. And for every person this morning that responded by saying, I want that relationship with Jesus, this morning we just ask that you just forgive us of our sins. We tried to do life on our own. We messed it up. We can't do it alone. So today we give our life to you ask that you forgive us come into our heart today Jesus you're number one from this day on I belong to you take my life it's yours thank you for forgiveness thank you for the price that you paid for my freedom today and father for every other person in this room God that in their heart you're stirring you want to do something great it's been a great 51, but the end counting is coming. You've got great plans for them. God, I pray that over these next few days, these next few weeks, that you begin to prepare us, get us ready. Let us be the people that you created us to be to truly discover what it means to live life on purpose for you. Father, just give them the wisdom, give them the courage, give them the ability to obey, to walk in obedience, give their life away, give their trust away, and to give their obedience away. And Father, we'll celebrate everything you do in every life. In Jesus' name, amen.